Well, hey, like Justin said, my name is Alan Seaborn. I've had a privilege to be here with you. Uh, this is my third time over the course of this summer, and I'm excited to be back and share with you again. If you were here last time I shared, you know I talked a little bit about how I am a huge NBA basketball fan. And when I got done with college, my first job that I took was at a church over by Detroit. And I was excited about the job, not just because of what I was going to have a chance to do at the church, but I also was excited to get season tickets to go and watch the Detroit Pistons play. This was when they were kind of in their declining years after they had been good, but that's okay because I grew up, my dad was a huge Michael Jordan fan, so Michael Jordan fans like it when the Pistons are bad, so he kind of taught me that, you know. So I went and I rooted against the Pistons most of those games. I know that it's lost some of you there, but it's okay. Uh, one of those games, something happened that I think back on this pretty often, actually. You know that during timeouts or dead balls or halftime or whatever, uh, whether you've been to a basketball game or a Whitecaps game during the middle of uh, innings, they have kind of an MC that will come out and try to keep the crowd excited, try to keep the momentum going, try to distract you. This is what they really are doing. They're trying to distract you from the fact that nothing is happening in front of you. So one of these games, I think it was during uh, the break between one of the quarters, the MC came out on the court and he's trying to keep the momentum high. You know, he's excited. He's bouncing around and yelling and smiling. He said, hey, we've got this game coming up. We're going to have a random fan come out on the court and he's going to play a game that's kind of a mixture between like a trivia game and a basketball skills game. And so he explained what was going to happen is this guy was going to start from half court. And now this isn't exactly right. This is a little less than how long a, a half of a court would be on an NBA court. But if you imagine that the basket is on that end of the room, on that wall, this guy started at half court. And the host explained that, okay, I'm going to ask him three questions about Pistons trivia. And depending on how many he gets right, he gets to move closer and closer to the basket. Then he's going to get to take one shot. He's going to have a chance to win a prize pack, which is the normal stuff they give away there. You know, a couple jerseys or Piston shirts, whatever. Gift cards to some of the things around the, uh, the concourse there at the palace. And so he gets him here at half court. And he asks this guy the first question. And the first question, you know, in these games, really, really easy. Like, do you know what day it is today? Good job, you got it. So this guy, he gets the first question right. And he moves from half court up to the three-point line. If you're picturing a high school court, you're not right. It's like way further. It's, it's another five, six feet. If you don't play basketball, it's a long way to throw it to the hoop from the NBA three-point line. So this guy's not in range yet. The host, the MC, he asked him the second question. This one was still pretty easy, but it was yet to know a little bit about the Pistons, their history. This guy got the second question right. So he got to move from the three-point line up to the free throw line. And now he's got the final question. The MC asks him, and personally, you know how on um, like the Price is Right, how the crowd shouts out and tries to help the people that are playing? This guy didn't know the answer. I don't think, okay? He didn't look like he knew. But the crowd, someone in the crowd yelled it out. He said it like he thought of it, and uh, they counted it. So he got to move from the free throw line up to the right block. If you've watched a basketball game, this is where the guys line up when someone's shooting a free throw. He's about two feet away from the basket. He's moved all the way from there to here. And so the MC is real excited. He's like, hey, I want to remind everyone we've got this guy. He's taking the shot from the right block, which is a layup, a two-foot little shot. And when he makes it, he's going to win this prize pack, the jerseys, the gift cards. He's going to win everything. So while this guy's getting excited, the cameraman is zooming in on the face of this guy who's about to take the shot. And it's up on the jumbotron, which is bigger than this screen. And it's facing all directions in the middle of the arena. And so the host, he hands this guy the ball, and he shoots his little layup from the right block, and he bounces it off the backboard, hits the front of the rim, and bounces out. Yeah, and it was kind of, what happened there was kind of what happened at the palace, okay? There's 15, 18,000 people, depending, and there was kind of that, 
laughter for a second and then sort of a stunned silence. The MC is trying not to laugh himself. He's like slapping the guy on the back like, hey, good try, buddy. Can't win them all. You know, what are you going to do? Well, this guy, all you see up on the Jumbotron is now the, ho the MC trying not to laugh and this dude trying to get away from being seen by everyone in the arena. So he's got his head in his hands and he starts like speed walking to get off the court so that nobody can see him. While this is happening, people start booing the guy. So he's walking like this, he's walking, getting booed. I booed a little, it's a layup, come on. So, you know, he, uh, he's running off the court, head in his hands, can't believe it. And as I'm watching, I thought to myself, man, I bet you that guy would give anything to have a second chance at that, to get to do it over again. And we all know that feeling, don't we? Whether it's something that we said, or something that we did, or something that we didn't do, uh, a relationship that we burned some bridges, whatever it is, we know this, head in our hands, just trying to rush to get out of there because we don't want to live in that shame. We don't want to feel the after effects of what happens when things go bad. But we also know that the way the world works and the way that game worked, just like that guy didn't get a second chance, um, we don't get to go back and do those moments over again. We can't just pretend that we didn't say the wrong hurtful thing. We can't pretend that we showed up when we didn't really show up and just let's, let's act like that didn't happen. And because we know that so well, because we know the feeling of wishing things could be different than what they actually were, but also knowing that it's just not gonna happen, we have sometimes a really hard time. We project that feeling and that reality of how day-to-day -day life goes, we project that onto the way that we think God acts too. Now, we might not really say it out loud because that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to show up at church. You're supposed to believe that God wants to forgive and give second chances and give grace and all that stuff. You're supposed to believe that. But if we're completely honest, we know that we sometimes read Jesus talking about God as a good father who wants to give good gifts to his children. And we think, well, there's got to be a catch to that. That can't be really what God wants to do. When Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened, we replay moments in our life when we've been dealing with people and we knocked and we got the door slammed in our face. We saw it and we got taken advantage of. Um, we asked and we got burned. We know what that feels like. And daily life sort of teaches us that you're not gonna get something for nothing, right? I don't know if this has been happening to uh, a lot of people in here, like it's been happening to me lately, I've been getting a bunch of telemarketing phone calls on my cell phone lately. I was off the thing for a while, now they've come back strong. I don't know what they're doing, but they've, they're calling me all the time. And they're calling me from a 616, like 403, looks like a cell phone number. Is that happening to anyone else around here? Yeah, okay. I want to say cool, but it's not, so sorry. Um, but... I, so I answer, I'm the sucker that answers the phone because I'm like, I don't know, it looks like someone around here is trying to get in touch with me. And I'm getting a bunch of calls from these timeshare things, I'm guessing that's what the calls are for you too, that are offering me this wonderful free vacation. They're going to fly me down to Florida, four day, five night, or whatever, five day, four night, staying at this place down in Florida. It's going to be amazing. The only little catch is that I have to go and I have to listen to their sales pitch for one of the timeshares that they're trying to sell me. Now, I'm really stubborn. So it's actually crossed my mind, like I think I might kind of enjoy just sitting there and being like, no, I'm not buying it, no, I'm not buying it. Thanks for the free vacation, no, I'm not buying it. Um, however, I have a friend who 
he, first of all, he gave me permission to share this story, to tell you what I'm about to tell you. When I tell you what I'm about to tell you, you'll be like, holy cow, why did he let you tell that? But anyway, my, my buddy, he, he and I went to high school together, and he grew up around here, but he wound up moving down to Orlando because he met this girl online, and after he had known her for one month, please don't do this, anyone in here, after he had known her for one month, he moved down to Orlando. And as you can guess, that plan wasn't all that well thought out. He got down there, he didn't have a job. So he started working for one of these, selling you a timeshare if you come down and enjoy our free vacation deals. And he explained to me a little bit about how it works. He said, the first meeting you have is in a room like this. It's a bunch of people. One person kind of gives the overall vision of the timeshare, whatever. And then after that, you as an individual or a couple or a family, however it is that you signed up for this trip, you have to go and meet individually with someone like my buddy, Dan. And Dan, he had the power over your life for until he signed off, if you left before he signed off saying, yep, you officially attended this sales pitch, you were on the hook for the flights down there, for the hotel stay, for getting into Disney World, or for the cruise, plus the taxes, and I'm sure they marked it up just because they wanted to stick it to you. Now, Dan explained to me how this sales pitch would go when he got people in the room. He said that he would say, oh yeah, you know, I agree, you're right, this is a little expensive, let me go talk to my manager. And he'd say, now, before I leave, just remember that if you leave here before I tell you we're done, then you gotta pay for all that stuff. All right, I'll, I'll be back. So he leaves, and he said sometimes he would go and watch a movie. Yeah. It's like, I'm like, Dan, how could you do this to people? This is horrible. He's like, I know, that's why I quit, but I did it for a little while. So he said legally he could keep people in that room for six hours as part of that sales pitch. And we've all heard something like that. Something where we know in the back of our mind, if you get offered a deal that sounds too good to be true, well, the catch is I got to sit in a little room with a guy for six hours and I'm not willing to do it. When we hear about things that are too good to be true, we know that it can't be real. And I think that sometimes we project that onto God. We think, well, I know how people work. And uh, God, I, I just can't believe that you're going to offer something to me freely. That, that all you ask is I surrender. I turn my life over to you. And it's, th that's, it's that simple. There's no catch. You want to restore my brokenness freely? We go, I... I I've been alive too long. I've heard too many stories. I know that it can't happen like that. I want to read to you from uh, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want to explain what's going on here in this chapter before we read the verses that are up on the screen. Because Paul is writing to this group of believers in um, Corinth. And in chapter 6, he's specifically addressing a problem that happened between two people in the church, or two groups, we don't know exactly, uh, because there were some people in church that had gone into business together. And we know human nature hasn't changed that much in the last 2,000 years. Something went bad with this business deal. We don't know exactly what it was, but we know how business deals go bad today, so we can imagine it was somebody that was feeling like their partner wasn't putting in enough hours or they were, they were feeling like, hey, I'm the controlling 51% interest in this company, we're doing it my way, or you can leave. You know, that kind of stuff. We know how things like that happen. And so what this had escalated to was it didn't just end at just a little bit of conflict. They wound up bringing a lawsuit against each other. And so Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and he's saying, hey, I need to tell you something because the world around us, they know that we're part of 
this body of believers who follows Jesus, who says that we want to live our lives and look like Jesus. That talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all these things. And he said, the fact that you're going this lawsuit route, the fact that probably what happened is one person felt cheated, and you know how we work, right? We don't just get exactly even, go, oh, you took an extra $10 out? Oh, I'm not going to take 10 I'm going to take 20 because I'm going to just make sure, you know, and it just slowly gets out of hand, and then boom. And Paul says, the world around us is watching, and what they're seeing when you do this, when you go the lawsuit route, when things spiral out of control, is you're telling the world around us that this Jesus thing, this life of love and joy and peace and patience and all these things, it works great. What Jesus teaches works perfectly when life is perfect. But when things go bad, you're telling the watching world that, yeah, it turns out when there's actually real life type of stuff, um, the, the stuff that Jesus talked about, the stuff that we claim that we want to follow him, that stuff doesn't really work. So we got to go the world's way because we know how things go. I've been burned before and I know how this is going to end. So I want the lawsuit route. And so Paul says in the verses right before this, he says, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you've been completely defeated already. He says, instead of just kind of letting yourself feel like you got cheated, you decide you're going to start doing the cheating so that you can get back what's yours. And that's what he says right before these three verses here in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. This passage, uh, this is my favorite three verses in all of Scripture. Because what Paul does right here is he outlines the gospel. He breaks it down and he lets us see in just this quick little snapshot what God does in our lives. So 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, talking about people cheating each other, why it's important to not do it. And he says, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. What Paul is saying in these three verses, is that no matter how much we've been around life and we've seen enough to be jaded, we've seen enough to be cynical, we've seen enough to maybe we've watched things go bad so much, we don't call ourselves cynical or jaded, we just call ourselves realistic. But if we view the world that way and think that things can't change, that God can't really offer his grace, this is Paul's response. And it's a beautiful thing because I think that there are two real ways that we can read this passage and it really hits two groups that I think we've all found ourselves in at one point or another on our journey of following after Jesus. And the first way I think of people reading this um, are people who kind of feel like those first couple verses are describing them too well. And there are people that read through that and go, yeah, okay, yeah, all these things disqualify me from God's kingdom. Well, then I guess I'm just out. I guess, I guess I've done too much or I've done the wrong thing too many times or I've hurt too many people. God could never forgive. And Paul's response to that in verse 11 he says, and that is what some of you were. Because in God's world, things don't work the way that we're used to things working. 
when we have this head in our hands, can't believe it moment, God does give a second chance. And if you're hearing that and you're still going, yeah, but Alan, you don't know what I've done to the people around me. You don't know what's going on in my mind. You don't know all these other things. That's okay. I don't. You're right. But I want to tell you a little something about the guy, Paul, who wrote this passage. Um, Because if anybody had a reason to believe that who they were disqualified them forever from being a part of God's kingdom, it was this guy. His story started out, uh, he was going at the time by the name of Saul. And Saul was a deeply, deeply religious guy. Now, the disconnect for him was that he didn't believe that Jesus was actually the Son of God. He didn't believe that Jesus came as Messiah to redeem his people. And so what Saul did is he decided to make it his life's work to stamp out Christianity. This is Paul we're talking about before his conversion, the guy who wrote the majority of the books in the New Testament spent a bunch of his life before that time trying to stop people from spreading the gospel. So he had people arrested. He chased people down like he was out trying to find people and throw them in jail. He was uh, involved at least one time that we know of in a stoning, an execution, a murder of somebody for preaching the gospel of Jesus. This guy, Saul, then met Jesus. If anyone had reason to say what I've done, who I am, who I've been, disqualifies me from ever being a part of God's kingdom, it was Saul, Paul. He spent so much time, so much effort, so much energy trying to be as anti-Christ as he could be. And this is the person that God totally changed and God used to write the majority of the books in the New Testament that we look back on now and, and help us to understand the depth of the work that God wants to do in our lives. So if you're here today and you're thinking, well, that's cool, this free grace, this forgiveness that God wants to offer, that's good for you guys, but he's never going to do it for me. Um, He wants to. He's ready. He's waiting. He's willing. You just need to ask him. And then there's a second group of people, I think, and we can read this passage in a different way. For those of us that have been around the church for a while, we can have a tendency sometimes uh, to look at people who are at the beginning of their faith journey or people who aren't on a faith journey at all. We think, why they, they just don't get it. I can't believe, why can't they grow? Why can't they stop doing this thing that they're doing? Why can't they start looking more and more loving and generous and gracious and all these things? And we kind of forget that the same grace that God offered to us freely God wants to offer to other people. And we can read this passage and see this huge list of all these things that disqualify people from God's kingdom. And we can read that first line in verse 11. And Paul writes, and that's what some of you, that's what some of we, us were. And it's a great reminder that all of us are on a journey that God is working in our lives and the same forgiveness, the same grace that he offered that changed our lives, he wants to offer to everyone, even the people who have hurt us, even the people that we have problems with, even the people that we don't want to get offered that forgiveness. I know that in the past couple months, you've had a series on Jonah and you think about what his story looked like, that right after God offered him a second chance, right after God had him spit out of this big fish and he gets to go and preach, 
he's mad because God offered that same second chance to people that he didn't think were worthy of it, to people that he didn't think had earned it, to people who were his enemies. And if we are stuck in that spot, if we are kind of content with our forgiveness, but we don't want other people to experience it, Paul writes and reminds us that that's where we were. We were separated. We were um, by our own choices, by our own behaviors, we were disconnected from God and his kingdom. And because of what Christ did, because of God's great love, he offered us that grace freely. And what I want to do uh, in closing here is give us a moment, whether we're in this category that we think, well, God can't or won't or shouldn't forgive me. Or if we think, yeah, I'm glad God forgave me, but some of these other people, he needs to deal with them a different way. That we can be reminded that in those head in our hands, I can't believe this, I wish I could have a redo moments, that that doesn't happen in regular life. But that's what happens in God's kingdom. That is the way that he works. He is so ready and willing to forgive. Let's spend time right now just asking him to do that in our lives. God, we thank you for the reminder from your word this morning about your character, about who you are. God, about the way that you want to break in to the normal routines of life, to the cause and effect world that we all live in where we know that if we make these mistakes, if we burn these bridges, if we damage these relationships, if we damage our own selves, God, that that we know we don't, we don't get a second chance. That's what makes your kingdom, your world so amazing, so different. God, we thank you for your grace, for your forgiveness, for your kindness. Help us to trust that about you. Help us to live in that reality. God, and if, if there's someone in here who's wanting to make that surrender that step of faith for the first time God want to make you Lord of their lives help them to trust God that you will make things new that's what you're in the business of doing and we thank you so much for that God we love you we pray these things in Jesus name amen while our God is mighty to save And as you go this morning, go enjoying and living in the peace that comes from his kindness and forgiveness. Amen.